you're back. I'm back and I'm excited. I'm excited that you're back. I should have said hi. I saw you at the fights, yeah. but you were wearing an awesome suit and you were talking to people and I was like, maybe he's fucking buying a casino. <laughs> no. I was just keep walking. <laughs> so I didn't stop. But no, I, saw you I was probably just uh, relaxing and, you know. Yeah. It was, it was quite the event. I mean... I was excited to be out in Vegas, though. You know, you know, Vegas is kind of you got that love hate relationship. It's kind of disgusting, but it's kind of great. <laughs> yeah. But I was actually out, and they opened up Delilahs that night, and yeah. I was just excited. Yeah, I was just was excited fun. to see people. You know, it, I was. I felt the same way. I was. I was at Delilahs the night before for mm -hmm. a, a big party. It was a blast and had a great time. I felt it felt like the before times. Yeah. You know, it felt yeah. like the before times. Like everything is is, is yeah. happening again. It felt good. It felt good. It felt good. Um, thank you for coming. I, I know that we're talking about uh, founding FUBU. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a audible, uh, an audio documentary. Right. It's an audible original. It's um, there is no book on it prior or a book that exists. This was purely created for audible. Um, it is the story of, how I founded FUBU with my partners, but also the good, the bad, the ugly, you know? Yeah. You, know, you got you got $300 million running through a, a, a company a year with a bunch of young African-American kids and then a bunch of Jewish guys and a bunch of Asian people, and Jewish yeah. women too. Um, and the innovation, the, 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 the having more in common than apart, and then the trying to go world domination, but... Then you got the bad guys and the bad girls from the streets. All a lot of stuff that I've never shared before. It's a, I mean, it's like a movie. It's like yeah. a, a drama. Um, it is. And I love, I live for these stories, especially. I, I mean, I've always been drawn to business stories. I love yeah. entrepreneurial stories where people take a risk, like take a shot. You yeah. know, it's, it's. There's a parallel to like trying to make it in show business. You're like, yeah. I'm gonna try to be an actor or a singer or a comedian. You just go like. We'll see. You, you you don't know how it's going to go. You don't know that when you're selling those that clothes out of the trunk of your car and giving it away to people. Yeah. Right. Like you're going to like hip hop video shoots. I think uh -huh. you told me, and you're like, yeah. Hey, wear this. Wear this, uh, and then you know they kick you off, and I'm still working at Red Lobster. I. I'm living in my my house, but we turned my house into a factory. We're sleeping in sleeping bags next to the sewing machines that the women are coming in and sewing. But then you got your inspirational moments because everybody's going to go through, hopefully, everybody's going to go through that time when they need to decide on where they want to go in life, where I was that waiter at Red Lobster and that guy finally just pissed me off and kept snapping his finger because he's on a date and he's actually on a date with a really hot girl, right? And a customer. A customer. And he kept snapping his finger, come over here, come over here. And at that time, I was a, I was, I was, I was little, but I was pretty hot guy yeah so i knew that i could have gotten his girl yeah yeah you know because uh -huh. i kept coming over him and looking at the girl like What's up? you mean yeah, anything yeah. and um and so <laughs> so he kept snapping his finger and the woman he's like give me some tartar sauce and i said because food was started it started to do well uh -huh. not really great but well i said no Go get your own fucking tartar sauce. How about that? And I, and that's the day I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what did he say when you told him to get his own fucking tartar sauce? He said, I'm going to call the manager. And, you know, the manager came over with Damien, you know, like, what's going on? I was like, I go fuck yourself. And I just yeah. quit. You know what quit, I mean? Yeah. So it was, it, was, it was that go fuck yourself moment. Yes. That it, we all want to have. That's <laughs> you the know? best. Yeah. And especially like, I mean, to know that you have something else going. Like you yeah. weren't like sabotaging your life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was, you know, I was in Red Lobster five years while I was sewing FUBU at really? night. Yeah, so it wasn't that it was like an easy transition. It went from 80, uh, you know, like 60 hours a week in Red Lobster to 50 hours a week in Red Lobster and 10 on FUBU. And then 40 yeah. hours a week okay. and then 20 on FUBU until I got to that point. I just had to make, the, I was scared to, scared to death. But since, I made the jump. since the day you quit, have you ever been to a Red Lobster? Yeah. I do go. You do? I go back once in a while. Yeah. I, do you like the Do you I, like the biscuits? I love the biscuits. The biscuits I, I love the, the biscuits. The my biscuits my wife, shit. my wife, you know, my wife doesn't like let me go. She doesn't like to let me go. She, my wife's super healthy. Right. So. She's like cholesterol yeah, and, and all yeah. that shit. But yeah. I, I love Golden Corral. I love Red Lobster. Man, I would love to go to a Red Lobster with you and just just get just like fucking break it apart. Yeah, yeah. Like it, just it, get three baskets of biscuits. Get it in. Get crab legs, lobster. Mm. Let's go nuts. Well, the ultimate feast, yeah. Let's do it, man. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> just because you're you, I'll treat you. I'll all right, you. all right. I, I'm down. I'll pay. <laughs> and I'll be like, hey, man. I'm down. Now, that's crazy to me. It's one of the things that sets me off the most. I've been on a date before mm -hmm. with a beautiful woman who, if you watch somebody mistreat a server mm -hmm. a valet or something my opinion of you 
immediately shifts to like, oh, I don't like, I don't care how hot you are. I don't care who you are. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a shitty character trait. In some uh, I believe, uh, you know, because you know, people for some reason or another think because you're doing this, that they're better yeah. than you when... Yeah. You could be, you could be, you could be out there trying to, you know, doing it because you're trying to make it through school because yeah. you're going to be a heart surgeon one day and sure. save lives, of right? Of course. So yeah, I, I find that. But I, I find, you know, after working in the food industry, I'd worked at Church's Fried Chicken, I worked at various other places. You don't do that unless you have all your food at the table. Right. Right. Don't right. do that. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. Do not yeah. do that. And I've, the people... I've seen some really bad things happen to people's food in the kitchen. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I know I've gotten sick a few times, I guess, but. uh no, oddly enough, I feel like the most, like the people who mistreat people like that are, it's not like in the movies when it's like the super successful guy who, who you know, that, that can happen. But I'm saying I've seen it more from people who are you're like, who the fuck are you? Yeah. Like, what yeah. are you doing treating people like this? I think man? that's the only time that they can, you know. Flex their power, whatever. Yeah. No they power. can only feel like they can, they can be important. And it's sad. It's sad. But, you know, people yeah. are people. So. People are people. Um, re regarding FUBU, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, but do you recall ever, and maybe this is, uh, documented in this giving a garment, a article of clothing, something to somebody that you're like, Oh my God, excited to. And they're like, I don't wear this shit. Like, have you ever, did you ever see that in your early days where somebody rejected you? Cause I always feel like those moments would stick with someone. It's a good question. I have, I did not see it, <clears throat> but when you're giving garments away, you, you can't you can't know everybody's taste sure um but it got to a point it did get to a point where i was giving it away to a good amount of artists and i would notice they were never wearing it mm -hmm. um and their cousins and everybody else would wear it and that's fine too because at least it didn't go to waste but yeah. i said to myself at a certain point you know they just don't like the brand mm -hmm. but they don't want to say it to me because uh -huh. they want to try to get a check another way you, you know right. what i mean so it got to the point where we would not give anything to anybody unless we had already seen them wear it you had to see, oh, that's a good way to establish. This. So you're a, at least you, you're a fan of what we're doing. You're a fan of what we're doing. And that, that probably was after we were giving away so much. Because when you give so much away, you know, people tend to not value it as much. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so they'd be like, oh, I'll get some more anytime. And they give it away. And then all of a sudden, that special piece you want them to wear, they never wore it. Yes. And all of a sudden, the season's over. And you got to give them some more stuff. So The parallel in the comedy world is free tickets. There are places that the, like especially in the club world, where their whole business is like, here are free tickets to shows. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that, that because they only care that the people are going to come in and do the two drink minimum right. and, the, and, the, and the basket of fries or whatever. And then you go like, yeah, man, they're not valuing what's on stage because you're telling them it's fucking free. Right. And every week you're just like, free, free. And then people wa would walk up to these clubs and be like, hey, I want tickets. And then you're like, yeah, you got to buy them. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 this place is free. <laughs> right. like, no, it's not free. 100% spot on. It's the same thing in any business, right? We always say that, you know, somebody needs to either fill out an application or spend a dollar, you know, because then it's not free. And in their mind, even though something is worth $100, but for right now, if you just buy it for a dollar, at least you've gotten the, them to the transaction to be something of value. This is a value. is exchange. And yeah. that's exactly what they do in click funnels and as you, you know, yeah. in business and stuff like that. Um, is there a moment where, like, because obviously, you know, like when you quit Red Lobster, you're like, it's, things are at least trending in the right direction with FUBU, right? You're yeah. starting to work less hours as a server, you know, you're seeing things pick up. But is there a, a point when you actually go like, holy shit, this is really taking off? Do you have like a moment for that? Yeah, we, we, we go over some of those times. It was, it was many of those times because my partners and I always thought that the best we would have is maybe a boutique where all four of us could work mm -hmm. or maybe four boutiques in the hood but as it kept growing we were like holy shit look like look where we're at uh so I, I go over some of the some of the times of celebration like my first car i bought the lexus 360 mm -hmm. you know and i bought the the 80 cd changer uh -huh. right right and 80 I, 80 <laughs> 80 and I sat out front of Macy's. We just got the Macy's windows. Uh -huh. I had the trunk open because everybody didn't need to see that I had I had eighty CDs yeah. at any given moment. I could <laughs> I could just play one of them. <laughs> and we had a, a cold like a bond cold, car. Yeah, we had a cold cold forty dog and some pork rinds, and we just sat on the on the edge of the car with all and all the girls go, "My like, yo, that's that's us in the window, that's baby." Theory, you know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. You want some pork rinds? You know what I mean? <laughs> what do you want to hear? What do you want to hear? I got eighty. I got eighty artists right there. Eighty. Um. So a lot of those happened. A lot, of, Petro, a lot of those moments. Yeah. A lot yeah. of those moments happened. It was really great. That's amazing. How about? Because I mean, you you grew up in 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 New York, and you're mm -hmm. a big hip hop fan, and you're meeting artists. Yeah. Do you have? You know, like a holy shit moment. I'm meeting like somebody I'm a huge fan of, and they like my my, my what my clothes. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up not only in New York. I grew up in Hollis Queens, right? And Run DMC, LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, Ja Rule. I mean, I was telling you a little earlier, introducing one of my buddies that um, yeah, me, Hype Williams, um, my friend Alfred, and um, why some who else I'm blanking out on? Hype, me, Al, Hype. And Irv Gotti, we all went on the tours as roadies on the tours on the first hip hop tours. The ones with uh, this tour had um, LL, uh, Run DMC, Big Daddy Kane, Eric B. Rock, Kim, um, uh, and Public Enemy. So we were all on those tours. That's a wild as tour. Kids. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were and you're actually working on those tours. Well, no, no. But like, you're my job. My job was to wear an all access pass and. When the girls, because at that time there were no other real tours, so when the girls and all the people stand outside the hotel, so Big Daddy Kane's job on the tour mm -hmm. was to say, blah, 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 blah. So girls were staying at the Radisson, <laughs> and so woo, when he said that, we were like, it's on. So, <laughs> so now all of a sudden, the, and these these rat these hotels are the small hotels. These yeah. weren't the massive ones. Yeah. It, the parking lot would have three, four hundred people outside. They all try to get inside. Um, and what I would, would the would the hotel be like? Oh my god! No, the police, the police <laughs> would be police? outside. Oh, right, and right. my job, and our job was to go out with the all access passes and saying, "Hey, you guys want to get in? You know, who do you want to see?" And we, our job was to allow them to get in. Wow! And, and that was it. That That's was a real job, job man. That's yeah, a good and job. and to sell tickets outside the arena, uh, extra tickets that they had, uh -huh. we were supposed to go outside the arena and sell them. I bet you could sell well. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I could sell well. Um, that, that was our job, and in, in, in payment for that job, it was to be able to be on tour and, and see all these great artists performing yeah. that we love. And that's what inspired me about to, 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 to start FUBU, because I remember saying that, well, I can't, I could dance a little bit. I remember I was gonna, I was gonna, um, I was potentially gonna be able to be a dancer for Houdini, and my mother said, uh, you're not going on a tour as a dancer. Um, and then I got replaced by a kid out of Atlanta called uh, named Jermaine Dupree. Oh, he could dance too. Yeah, yeah. he replaced me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But other than that, I realized that there was there was something I can do to to have fun and make money at it, which was maybe maybe creating the uniform for these artists and right. for these people in the audience. So uh, now, so was was that found day? Because I remember, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Wasn't LL a big FUBU guy? Wasn't he wearing FUBU a yeah, lot? Yeah, LL was the LL is the one who put us overboard. Uh, he he wore. Was it. the foundation of that relationship that tour though? Yeah, well, L grew in the neighborhood, yes, and and we got to know him more on the tour because he was he was he was touring, and everybody in the neighborhood knew him, but everybody was asking him for things. Yeah, um, and so when I would go on the tour, I wasn't on the tour bus. I I was one of the only kids with a car. Mm -hmm. um, I would make my way up to Troy, New York, or Albany, or whatever, locally, yeah. Philadelphia. And I remember one day, LL said to me, he said, hey, you going back to Hollis? I said, yeah. He said, I got something important for you to do for me. I said, all right, well, what is it? Um, and he gave me his shitty little laundry. Like, I mean, all his drawers, all dirty and shit. And he said, take this to my grandmother. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Yeah. I have LL's draw. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I guarded those under those shitty little underwear with yeah. my life. And yeah. I took that to I took that to his grandmother. And that was one of the proudest moments of my life. Yeah. I mean, but also I bet he knew you were the guy to ask. And you were somebody who knew that ass, like, don't fuck this up. Yeah. Like treat this like he yeah, I gave you a bag of money. It was like off. coming to America. When you think of yeah. dirty underwear, yeah. think of me. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> So and then did other guys on the tour? Did they also? Were you able to connect with them when you're making the FUBU? No, no. Well, what really happens? You go on the tour, you start to meet the bodyguards of everybody, and then the bodyguard goes, or a tech guy or somebody goes, "Hey, I'm working the new edition tour next summer," or "I'm working the Bobby Brown tour next summer," and then you start to move throughout 
the industry knowing people you know what i mean mm-hmm. um and and that helped you know that, that that's what helped me kind of move around yeah it's it's an it's an amazing story because i feel like what what was the it was sometime in the 90s right where things really exploded yeah so i started in 89 i closed it three times up until 92 i ran out of money ran out of whatever um really took a go at it 92 and and then really got it got hot around 97. 97. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to like 97 is when I graduated high school. It's mm-hmm. also like music videos are exploding left and right yeah. everywhere. And you, and I, and seeing it like in music videos and then on campus, cause that's when, you know, I went to college and you mm-hmm. just started to see it everywhere, man. Mm-hmm. It's wild that like you making this sewing in an apartment and then yeah. it became a worldwide brand. Yeah, we'd have never thought. We're just doing something we love. It's crazy, and now it's still international. Yeah, uh, sell so Japan. Still and- yeah, we're really big in the Philippines. Um, Korea is more like a skate brand in Korea. Uh, South Africa does quite well. Uh, Germany. We're, still, we're having a resurgence, I think, because of uh, 90s hip hop is back. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a lot of the social issues going on in the world. Yeah. Um, so it's uh it's it's actually starting to bubble again. It's amazing. I, I I'm fascinated by that in in the in the fashion world too. Because another brand that I was like, you know, I don't remember seeing. I mean, it was always there, but I don't remember like seeing it be like cool. And now I feel like it's kind of somehow popped to that. And I'm seeing uh, brick and mortar stores. So it's Champion. Yeah. You know, like Champion was always like I don't know, kind of like workout gear yeah. sort of. And, yeah. and Champion now it was like big a, in New York though. Champion was, was always big in New York. Champion and Starter. Sorry, um, I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's coming back. I'm not sure why. I think maybe it was acquired by somebody else, or you know, you never know. Sometimes it's just the machine behind it. Yeah, you know? that yeah. like can drive it. Mm-hmm. But with yours, it's like it is like a you know like a resurgence, right? Like yeah. it kind of come back up. That's got to feel good. It always is good. It's great when you a new generation, you know, embraces something you know um, that you have. And how important is it? Because you know, obviously, <laughs> not trying to compare the two, but like. We're always doing like, you know, hiring people to do designs, right? For merchandise and stuff. And when, what's the process like when it's a big company like yours yeah. and you, obviously it's important this shit's hot or, you know, if you, if you get just like put designs out that, that suck, you know, like how, how, <clears throat> what's the process like? Well, the process has changed greatly over the last um, 20 years due to technology, right? Cause now things can be done on the fly. You can get it virtual from people. You can actually print on demand. So you can maybe put up four pieces and say, you know, what do you want to see or a subscription model or pay in advance for it. So it's much different now. Before the process was one year earlier, you were designing the next year. Um, So Wow, a year. A year earlier because what you had to do is you'd have to go to all these countries and buy samples and, 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 and see what leathers you like or style or design, whatever case is. Then you finally go over to Asia or wherever you are manufacturing it. Then you have to source all the materials. That takes 90 days just to get the fabrics in. Another 90 days to sew it. Another 90 days to ship it. Mm-hmm. Before you know it, you know, you got, and you got to have it here in very specific times. You had to have it here. Back to school clothes must be here by July. That's when they start putting it out and then holiday. And then so it, it was always timely. Now it's much easier because you can do print on a man and, and, and other other things. But and you can just be like, send me a bunch of designs. Yeah, because like even like when we have like, I want to do this. Yeah. Sometimes they'll, they'll be like, here's 15 versions of it. What do you like? Yeah. You yeah. know, oh, I like that. Let's get more in this direction. Yeah. And you can source it with a lot of people now. And you can do ways that if their design sells or this click throughs, they know the percentage they're getting off each one of their designs. So it's, it's so much more advanced and easier now. Wow, impressive, man. Um, I wanna go back to your your crew of uh, you, Hype, and your friends. Yeah. Um, that crew inspired the belly story? Yeah, so my buddy, uh, we all knew each other, but my, my buddy was, you know, he was hustling. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, Hype Williams made the movie about him. His name is Alfred, uh-huh. um, and uh, and his he real Alfred was the character, the inspiration for the Bunce. DMX character, Tommy Bunce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild. Yeah, um, and we you know we listen. Um, it, I I don't know what's in the water in Queens, but you know we all had this big 
entrepreneurial drive to us because obviously Hype went on to do great things. Great things. <clears throat> Irv went on to have uh, Murder Inc. Records and Ja Rule and Ashante and all those people. And then, you know, uh, myself, I, I had the clothing thing going. So, uh, and that was, that was four young kids at around 14, 15 years old who just, we had nothing besides, you know, a, a, a dream, you know? Do you remember uh, seeing Belly the first time? Because I do. I do. Yeah, I mean, it's because... His for people that don't know, and, and music videos have changed so much. Mm -hmm. It used to be like, wait, you know, MTV was round the clock music videos yeah. and VH1, and now it's like reality shows. But hype also had such a unique eye, like, n no one's videos looked like his videos, right? And then he made a movie that the movie is like a 90 minute music v video, video, yeah, you know, yeah. And from like the cinematography is almost almost what stands out the most because you'd see shots and you're like holy it's the opening sure. which is like Nas and them walking through that strip club with the, with the, with the eyes, eyes yeah. and the black light mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and the acapella yeah steady are you ready going on uh -huh. and it was like yeah when that movie starts you're like what the fuck am i watching yeah it's crazy yeah, yeah and um and and dmx is amazing in it mm -hmm. i mean you know the guy was a natural performer we were talking about dmx a little a while ago that he you know everything that i've heard about people who knew him one-on-one -on -one say there's nobody as authentically themselves as him mm -hmm. but as a performer i mean you watch him in that movie you're like this guy's a natural actor too you know yeah so, and he and he i don't know and yeah he he was he was so amazing and he he pulled so many things he he, he felt like i was looking at my buddy al in in certain ways really yeah incredible story yeah and do you still keep up with hype we haven't i haven't caught up with him lately i just went to dinner with herb the other night, um, and I brought my buddy Al out here um, with me to uh, see me film Shark Tank. But Hype is in Atlanta, and I don't get to see him as much, so I probably talk to him like once a year. Okay. So you just wrapped, is it season, or no, not even wrapped yet. You're yeah, I'm in the middle. We're in the middle. middle of shooting season 13. Dude, I mean, yeah. 13 seasons 13 is... 13 years. Is bonkers. We were just talking about how it's like, it's what people want to talk about too. When they meet you and they meet other sharks, they're just like, they care about that show. Yeah. That show fascinates people, which I get because I see the, that it airs nonstop on what CNBC, channel? CNBC, it airs nonstop. It's like first runs are on um, ABC because it's an ABC show. It is ABC. A lot of people I, even think it's a CNBC show. I didn't even know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it is one of those things where if I walk in the room and like someone's in the middle of their pitch, I'll be like, let's see what this guy's got. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know, I, I just want to see what it is. Uh -huh. and, so, and the funny thing is, it, there's almost like a, something familiar to American Idol in the early days. When the early when American Idol started, you're like, let's see if this dude can sing. Yeah. And then if they can sing, you're like, holy shit, they can sing. And if they're whack as fuck, you're like, oh my God, you suck. Mm -hmm. And so it's like that same kind of thing. I don't know, something about the human condition where you go like, I want to see this either way. Yeah, I want to see if it's terrible. I want to see it unfold. Yeah, and, and see if these guys shit on it, or if they're like, "I, uh, I would like you to give me five million dollars for two percent yeah. of my company." Yeah, um, and see if they're completely delusional, and then it's also inspiring to see somebody with a knock it out of the park product that you guys are like bidding over. Yeah, I th you know what? I think that the world falling apart really has made people go back to Shark Tank. Shark Tank came out in '08 when the world was falling apart. Wow! Right? '08? Yeah. Yeah, 08, I, th I think 08 or maybe 09. I know we shot it for sure in 08. Um, and I think that now, as people look at it, they go, man, I was working on somebody else's dream and they just didn't do the right thing and I got to work on my dream. Or somebody yeah. goes, you know what? I'm saving two or three hours round trip a day, you know, ha not having to go to work. Let me start on some of these things, right? right? So I think that it, it's it's just... It's, it's a show that, that shows if you're going to sit there laying on the couch thinking you can't do it and you're seeing other people do it, you go, all right, it's time for me to do it's it. It's time for me to do it. Yeah. And yeah, then it's also the ones you, you hate people too because, you know, it also has gotten to the point where you do see the, I need $400,000 for 2%. Yeah. And and I, I always say, that, well, fuck it, why don't you just make it 0%? I mean, we're only two points away from yeah. zero. Why don't yeah. I just give you yeah. $400,000, right? Give you a right? You a donation, What's wrong man? with you? Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You, you come in here to uh, just get a commercial. You just yeah. don't want a deal, right? Right, right. And so you, you get that discovery because sometimes they don't want a deal and you're at home going, oh, this person's a savage. But then sometimes 
you know, you see you, you see it move from the two to 15. You go, oh, they do. It, so it's, it's really interesting yeah. to try to sniff out that person when they're, sure. when, they're try, when they're looking for that money. And it's interesting, though, too, I think, like, it's what you're pointing out is that, you know, you guys are all experienced business people. Yeah. You know, and, and you can see sometimes, you know, you see somebody walk in from, the, from your home. You can be like, this person's nervous. They, they've never been in this world. Correct. They're, they think they're doing something like ballsy by being like two percent yeah. you know they think, they think that's like an aggressive move and they don't know that it's like delusional and insulting basically you know i, I gotta tell you what i think about it you come in asking for two to give up two percent for whatever two hundred three hundred thousand dollars right four hundred thousand dollars it's a couple of things either you don't want to deal mm -hmm. either you raise so much capital that you only probably have ten percent to play with ah, you, you know what i mean right or it means that you're hemorrhaging. The business is doing a large amount of money, but there's no profits in the business. You're still trying to get money in. Where'd the profit go? You're either not selling it a high enough, mm -hmm. or you guys have made a lot of mistakes, or you're, you're, you're sucking the business dry of its money and you're looking to use my money. Those are all the reasons for yeah. me. You know what I mean? And then the worst part is not, they go, all right, all right. I'll give you the I'll give you the money for the two percent, and they go. All right, so we need you. We need you to make some calls. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm working now for the two percent. Oh, right, right. Yeah. If I send my money over to Apple, they don't dust Steve Jobs off and call me and ask me how to fix some shit. <laughs> yeah. Why am I going to give you money right. and then and I got to work, work yeah, for yeah, it? No, no, no. That's so, right. but you, I don't know you when you come on the show. You've seen me for 13 years, or yeah. you at least did your homework and right. said, "Let me go over some of this before I walk in the room." Yeah. So. You can tell that I get passionate about it because yeah. either these people are idiots or whatever, yeah, but you, yeah. that comes across on the camera when you see us pissed off. Sure. And a lot of time people say to me, Damon, how dare you? You told somebody, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to make a, a decision on what you're doing. That pitch was 45 minutes long. I've been I've been offering this asshole $500,000 right. for the last half an hour, yeah, and yeah. you're not paying attention to me. Right. I mean, you know. No, I like it. I like I like you being this fired up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got, I actually had an opportunity one time uh, where I was. I'll, I'll tell you off camera. A company that is a clothing company, mm -hmm. right? A smaller clothing company, and I went to their offices, and I really liked their stuff, and I liked what they were doing. And they asked me if I wanted to be an investor, mm -hmm. and I got excited because I mean, it's just like that world of like, oh, an investment in a, yeah. in a company. I, I got really excited. So I, I told my business managers, you know, I think I want to do this. And they go, well, we're going to ask for their, you know, their uh, due diligence. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, and, and send over. And they, they sent over all the, the numbers. And then it, they basically uh, broke it down, evaluated it for me. And they go, you don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a case of them essentially just looking for money to keep things going. Yeah. Right? And, and at least they were transparent in what was happening. But I was like, ah, oh, I was all bummed out. I was like, I was all excited. This is going to be my, my. Some people just don't know what they don't know. Yeah, you know, and they think for some reason. A lot of people don't understand money. Money. Money will highlight your weaknesses too. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a clothing company, but you're not, the margins aren't big enough, or you're putting out ads and they're not converting. Well, buying more ads, you have more shitty ads that are not converting. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and a lot of people go, well, if I only get this, well, if I only get this. No, no, you have to build a community and don't go and buy inventory, more inventory. You have to, you'd rather try to catch up with sales, meaning I don't have enough come back. And th that creates also this whole thing of, oh man, I better, I better buy that shirt now because I'm not going to see it next week. But if you have a ton of shirts, a ton of product, then something's not working. Right. You know, and don't spend more money to you know to highlight that weakness and then i assume with like some of these um investments you make from the show uh even though you don't want to be like put to work you end up being like a mentor of sorts yeah. to the people right you know and i understand that comes with it and, but, yeah. but that's why the sharks ask for we want to get better treatment than the traditional investor who's just putting in capital right right because right. if we're going to get to work we're going to call and open up doors for you then why shouldn't we get preferential treatment yeah you no know, for our money yeah you should be rewarded for yeah of course because then because then why don't i just spend more time on my own damn business yeah you know so yeah um you are uh are also going to be producing right uh, yeah. some, some uh, audio stuff for audible 
Yep. Um, are, yeah. there, are there new shows coming down the pipeline? There are. I, I just uh, I can't speak of any at the moment. Okay. Um, but yeah, you know, some more Audible originals. We think that there's a lot of stories that people want to hear that they don't have necessarily time to pick up a book. They can listen to it, obviously, though. It's the best. Driving, wherever, yeah. get on the treadmill, whatever the case is. Yeah. Yeah. Get on the train, pop in your headphones and, you know. That's it. Yep. Buy Raycon.com. <laughs> Sponsor. I don't know. No, no problem. Maybe they'll buy another one. Uh, what is your take on, because I know you're, you're a savvy business guy, and in the last, especially in the last year, a couple of things that have just never stopped being talked about. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency, NFTs. Bitcoin, and NFTs, right? Yeah. Like, just all the time. Mm -hmm. I have a guy that works here that has a virtual fucking racehorse. Like, a virtual racehorse? Yeah. So he bought a virtual racehorse that competes in virtual races. He's out of his mind. Yeah. Well, He's I don't there. know. Yeah. Um, Red. I've never heard of that. Um, is he on Earth 2 as well? Is he on Earth? Earth 2. Oh, I don't know. Is a, is a, is a virtual world. I believe it's called Earth 2. I don't know. Can you Google that? Uh, I think it's Earth 2. Great. You're going to make him fucking buy something else today. <laughs> you can buy tiles. You can buy tiles of... Uh... Oh. There you go. Dude, so, you just ruined his night. Yeah. He's going to come in tomorrow and be like, guess yeah. what I got on Earth 2? Yeah, you can buy all. Well, I'm sure Beverly Hills is all taken. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know. Pomona's probably open. Yeah, I think Pomona's open. Um, yeah, so, yeah, NFTs, cryptocurrency, um, I'm still trying to figure it out and learn it as well. I do know that all the people I respect know that NFTs is obviously going to be um, a path forward and there's going to be uh, very good ways for people to you know to utilize it I've, I've seen some creative things happen yeah um you know crypto i mean people just got to really get to understand it you know what it, where is the backing behind it is it is this is this a pump and dump or is it something and there's a mixture of it's a mixture of often um branding by mm -hmm. people always saying oh well i know Do doja coin or doja coin or whatever the case is so it's a funny space if you have a couple of dollars, you know, the more, the more branded ones that you see that you feel there's a good backing, it doesn't hurt to put $500,000 in and then leave it. Leave it. The, the, biggest, the biggest problem I see with people because we have so much access is that when somebody opens a TD Ameritrade account or what was that, Robinhood or something yeah. like that, yep. or a crypto account, they feel like they're Gordon Gecko once they go from, you know, $2,000 to 6000 and they trade. Which right. is, it's good, right? It's a profit. But if you would have put, I think, $20,000 into Apple in 1998, it would be worth a billion now if you didn't touch it after what? all the splits. Yeah. So the real thing to do is hold. Yeah, which is a very, it's, a, it's an act of discipline. It's, it's an act, it's hard. And there's nothing exciting. I, I, yeah. I opened up my uh, a Robinhood account and, and I got to do something with it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that that is where you see people which i've made the same mistakes too sure. because i i've made some good money off of apple and i traded it though yeah yeah you know so well i think that's like the like kind of one of the most famous lessons uh that buffett talked about was that you know like his kids now say like yeah we didn't we didn't grow up the son of this multi-billionaire because he would buy stuff and just sit on it mm -hmm. like he sat on it for decades yeah and decades later things started to be worth so, so much more. Exactly. And he was a super disciplined guy. Very, and that's why he didn't, he didn't even look at the stock market every day. They were like, oh, the market's down, the market's up. He's like, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, he looked at it a little bit with his, you know, the whole theory of he bought sausage on his, uh, you know, he, he bought a sausage McMuffin uh -huh. uh, in the mornings when the market was up. Uh -huh. um, but he never really stressed the market that right. way, you know? Right. He knew that, you know, if he saw it was down, he'd just double down on some stuff, but he, he didn't stress it that way. People's fantasy, though, the excitement is like, I'm a day trader. Yeah. Which they don't know that, like, the smallest percentage of those people are actually good at that. Yeah. You know? And, and they're candle sticking, and they're, yeah. they're looking at that thing moving in pennies. and you know, Pennies, yeah. And they have these robots who are, you know, also, you know, they're, they're pulling the trigger on a lot of stuff, so... Yeah, that's got to be nuts. And that's, uh, I don't have the temperament for that. I <laughs> yeah, I, I would fucking lose my mind. You go crazy. These guys do. Yeah. Well, the younger guys, the younger yeah. guys and girls, they, they, they do it. They, they get excited about it. And it's good, though, you know, to, because when you look at stocks and commodities and those things, as you see them moving up and down and you understand where it's come from, you, you become a more worldly person also. You yeah. start to see what's happening in the world. So yeah. I think that that, it forces you to say, well, what's, 
what's earth two let me go look at that all right well let me see these and it it, it, it broadens your mind but then you gotta have that discipline in you some have areas, to you yeah know? which yeah. is a hard how's mama's wig doing what's your horse's name kent blazemore what kent blazemore kent blazemore kent kent blazemore blazemore is the name of his virtual horse yeah mm. you mean like blazemore i think so yeah or i think he's meaning like <laughs> blazing by people trailblazer have you made any money nope <laughs> okay just like normal people who own horses yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, wait, what is, because that's a good point. Um, everybody fantasizes about being a, a baller and like doing baller shit. Like yeah. Planes and yachts and then some of them get into horses. Mm -hmm. Did you ever pull the trigger on some crazy shit? Like a, like doesn't have to be a horse, but something in that world where you're Expensive like. Expensive and. You're like, no, what the fuck not, did I buy? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I one, bought, so, uh, one time I bought, I bought two houses about. 10 blocks from each other really yeah because yeah. um, were you were you upset about you're like i should have gotten this one i bought one in a, in portofino in um in miami uh nice good condo but i realized it didn't have a a dock i you know i didn't have a dock yeah so then i bought a house 10 blocks away with a dock when i could have just put my boat in the marina downstairs but i didn't but think like, about that oh you didn't think about that no because use... i could just spend i could just buy another house yeah so it was pretty idiotic idiotic but also pretty fucking cool <laughs> you know it was one Did you point keep both for a while yeah one time i had about eight houses but what i realized was that by the time i got to the house and um i pointed out all the things that need to be done or fixed or whatever case the week the weekend was over i had to get back to work Oh right, and my friends enjoyed all these things more than I did. Yeah, um, and and so I got rid of them. I had gotten divorced, so the good part is that I got rid of them in '06, um, just because my fam my wife and I decided to separate, and um, we had a great great way to dissolve our marriage. So that wasn't the problem. I just was like, I don't need this anymore. She's right. not going to use it. I don't need this anymore. So I sold it the height on the market so every house i bought i sold it for two or three times more so that Jesus. was the best part about okay. it okay but other than that i learned a lesson i learned that you know you can only shit in one toilet you know yeah. you can only you know how many cars how many houses you need and i had a much better way of life after that point where i did not have to worry about stuff what's the perfect amount of houses <clears throat> i would say the per <laughs> you know <laughs> one one for all those who are going to say i'm an asshole but no, um no, no. My life, I, I would like, I think, I think three, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Let's very small, down. very small apartment in New York because that's just a hub of business. And New York's important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, my main home is upstate New York where, you know, I love and it's, it's. You it, can decompress and you can. I think 200 acres. I could just chill. Very small, very small. And then Miami where I, where I, where I really live. Where you get down. Store. Okay. Yeah. Where you have a dock. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, that would be great. <laughs> I'm trying to plan out where my three homes will be. That's all. I'm just thinking. I have one um, in Austin. I sold my house here. Uh, we, my friend and I were talking about where to have multiple homes. I thought a great place would be somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, like Montana, Wyoming. Yeah. Get away, decompress, have Kent Blaze more all up at the stall, you know? You know, uh, but remember when I had all those homes, it wasn't nothing like an Airbnb. Right. And now you can right, you have can a place, you can, you can have a place in Spain that you go to one time for four or five days. It's a $10 million place or a $20 million place. You spend, you know, $20,000 and you're done. No yeah. taxes, no maids have to clean up the place, no construction, no nothing. And you write half of it off. Right, yeah. because it's travel, T and E. So it's better to do it like that. See, that's why he's a shark. <laughs> uh, no, because I, I think I heard some version of this. I'm paraphrasing. They said like the best, the best thing is isn't owning a yacht. It's a friend that owns a yacht, right? Like somebody yeah. that gets to enjoy it without any responsibilities. But yeah. like their good friend has it and is like, yeah, come on board, because like your friends were enjoying these homes and all these perks. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's what I try to do. I try to mooch off all the other sharks. Yeah. Yeah. Cuban's playing. Barbara has a couple of houses. Robert has a couple of houses. 
yeah, all of them have have house. I just go, hey, I'm coming over there. You know? Stay there for a week, and yeah, that's it, pretty much. Yeah, that's the way to do it, guys. All right, I'm not gonna buy four more homes. <laughs> uh, what about should I get a plane? It depends. Depends on if you can you you you're putting that many hours in and you can travel constantly. Yeah. yeah, depends on if you. Depends on the losses that you want to write off if you can. All right, write that down. I'm gonna get a plane. <laughs> But you can get a when you get a plane, you can also rent it out simultaneously. Yeah, right. So charter it out to people. You, you charter it out too, because right now there's because obviously everything going on, people don't want to. They don't want to be in the airports. That's amazing. Yeah, the business has exploded. The luxury business has uh, has exploded. Yeah, yeah. That's the way to go, huh? But plane? Yeah. I personally don't have a plane. I, I had one at one time for a little while, and it was a pain in the butt. And I wasn't traveling enough. Okay. So you should see I, my tour schedule. Though. I charter. You know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot less, well, less than buying one, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, boats. Well, you have a you have a dock. I assume you have a boat. No, I don't have a boat anymore. But, but you had a boat. I had a boat. And Got why? Rid of that too. Because you just, you're like not using it. rather charter them. Wow. Yeah. These are all lessons you've learned. Yeah. Learned the hard way. Time and energy, you know, as well, right? Because it's, the, it's not only the money. It's how much time you're putting in on those things and how much are you getting out of it. Like if, I, you're, if you end up being on the boat six times a year well then why are you why do you have a boat why are you dealing with it right but you think every time you get one of these things that you're going to enjoy it so much yes you rather i'd rather charter and do all that stuff and then say i'm chartering so much that i might as well do it instead right. of doing it the opposite way acquiring it and and then realizing i don't need it see this is like this is a a new audible podcast right here <laughs> Financial life lessons. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? I think I am going to do something where it's like ask the questions that you were too intimidated to ask, you know, because. Well, you know, I don't know if we, we talked about this before, but it, it kind of makes me upset that we expect people to understand f finance and money. You don't, know, you don't hear anything in elementary school, in middle school, in high school. You have to pursue a degree in something mm -hmm. to even learn something of a cut. And then you just enter the real world and people are like, why do you have fucking this kind of debt? Why don't you know how to do it? And you're like, I don't know. Why would I know this? Spot on. We don't teach anybody anything with this. And people are ashamed when they're ashamed to say, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yet, at the dumbest time of your life, meaning 16, 17, 18, this is when you're, you, you feel like you have opinions, you don't have to listen to mom and dad all right. the time, but you don't know enough. You can take out a half a million dollars worth of student loans and yeah. debt, and debt that you probably won't pay up until you're 50, Crazy. for a career that you're not even sure you want. Right. So that is the biggest problem. Um, people don't know. They don't know what to do with taxes. They don't know how to pay taxes. A lot of people. They don't know how to avoid paying certain taxes that the government allows you to. Like right now, I don't know. If people know that for the next uh, year, uh, you probably know as a business person. But you know, this year and next year, you could write off a hundred percent of everything you everything you eat outside. You know, restaurants, right? Um, but people don't know that. Yeah. Um, but people just don't realize what to do with money and how money works. They don't know it all. Yeah, and we don't. You don't understand until unless you have ex like lessons and you've learned your life that yeah. it's a tool. You know, it's um, it can be used for opportunities. It can mm -hmm. be used to make things happen, but it can also destroy you. Destroy you. Yeah, it can yeah. be a huge burden. And I actually, uh, the older I get, the more I, I used to, when I was younger, I had no money. When I would hear about an athlete or an artist going broke, I'd be like, what a fucking idiot. Like, right. Why didn't he save his money? It was so mm -hmm. stupid. Mm -hmm. The older I've gotten, I actually empathize and I go like, oh my God, if I, now I go, if I were 22 and somebody was like, here's $26 million, I'd be like, <laughs> that shit would be gone. It'd yeah. be gone. People don't realize, listen. If you, got, if you got $100 million, well, you know, Uncle Sam's going to take their 40 or $45 million out of that, right? Yeah. So now you got 55 So instead of buying three houses at 500000 you just buy three houses at $5 million, right? You, you just make bigger mistakes, right? you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and that's what happens. And you turn around and you, you thought about the houses that you just bought. But if you're paying an average of two percent tax on those houses every year, well, then if you have, uh, you know, if you have just if you have twenty million dollars worth of homes, 
Well, I think uh, that's probably going to be two percent. Ten percent is 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 too much. You're going to be paying two hundred thousand dollars in taxes a year on on those homes. Just, Nobody thinks about that. Yeah, who doesn't know? Yeah, you got to do this podcast. You got to do. What do you want to know with, <laughs> about money? Yeah. Yeah, we think and you're going to reach more people too. Well, I you think more importantly, a lot of a lot of women, women control the household, the checkbook generally around fifty five percent. But most of them, a lot of them, do not know uh, how the money is being operated from the if if they happen to be in a in a relationship, um, they they often don't know how the money is being utilized. Is right. it in bonds? Is it in stocks? Is there uh, maturing insurance uh, accounts? Uh, you know, what reverse mortgages? What do they have? And, you know, so I think that, and a lot of them are just too intimidated to ask. Yeah. Though they're controlling. I like to keep house. my wife in the dark on that shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I like when she asks if she can spend, and then I just don't tell her anything when I do. You know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure, lady. Cars just show up at the house. And she's really? like, what's this? I'm like, it's something that I bought and I didn't ask you. Yeah. <laughs> well, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> okay, well. It's just that kind of house, you know? Yeah, different, yeah, yeah. Hey, different rules. There's no problem. I told you don't say anything until the food is actually on the table, right? Right. Oh, right. That's right. That's be right. <laughs> I should be careful. <laughs> <laughs> you know there was a woman that killed her husband slowly by putting a drop of antifreeze in his food every night? Um, specifically, I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine it. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've heard of a different poison that was used, but was it a drop of antifreeze every night? Yeah. Something like that. Wow. Wow. Hmm. He got so used to the taste of the food too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I mean, you can cut out of this podcast anything you want, right? Yeah, but I'm keeping that in. What? The antifreeze? Yeah. No, I'm saying the statement you made prior to that. I, oh, yeah, I yeah, take, yeah. I would take that out. Do you think I should take that out? So you don't have the antifreeze situation. Oh, later. right, right, right. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how many, uh, how, how did the process, because I'm telling you, I sign up for every business story. I read business articles. I love... The, that you guys did the Founding FUBU audio docuseries. How did the idea come about to share the story? Because I think it's a fascinating story. Well, I think that originally you, you, you see all these stories that are coming out, Big Epoch and all these things. And, and then somebody said to me, why are there, there are so many great stories that are coming out, but it's always music related or whatever. But what about the everyday person who, just had a good idea and they build something, what are they going to go through? And then I said, well, I was talking to us about some of these stories, like how when I went to Japan, um, <clears throat> uh, I remember going into the pool and I have, a, I have, I had a little tattoo at that time. And the guy said to me, well, you got, you, you, you can't, he gave me a little shirt to wear over the, my, in the pool. And I said, well, why do I got to do that? He said, well, you have a tattoo. I do that. All right. I'm in the pool, a bunch of other people in there, and I see them with all these, same thing, these water suits on, but I think they're, I don't know, I'm in Japan, I don't know, they're playing water polo, I have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. Going to the locker room after, I think I'm in the Ritz-Carlton on the Four Seasons, and all these guys take off this stuff, and they all are Yakuza. They all have all these, they, I mean, I mean, this yeah. just like dragons and all yeah. this stuff, and they kind of surround me in, in there, and they go, yeah, so, um, you know, we know who you are, and um, I think we should manufacture your clothes. And they said it in a very nice way, but it yeah. wasn't a nice way they were trying to do that. Yeah. Um, and I was telling somebody the story. Now, I happen to have been with um, Mitsubishi was distributing my clothes over there. So Mitsubishi found out and called over, and it was no problem. They all know each other in one way or another. But if that wasn't the case, somebody had already dropped the dime that I was there, and they were, they were basically trying to extort me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I told them somebody the story, and they were like, we never thought of that. We never thought of all the things that you have faced because the whole theory of founding food was I worked so hard to get out of the hood, my partners and I, to just change the world, have some fun. You know, growing up where I grew up, there's a lot of well-known drug dealers as well. And we never wanted to do that, never did it. But I found it was almost just as bad 
in the fashion world. Right. You know, it's not a secret. It's a cutthroat business. Mafia yeah. had, has a lot of stuff to do with, used to have a lot of stuff to do with clothing and all that stuff, you know? Then you got Yakuza over here. You have people who are, if you're somebody, you're making fifty or $60,000 a year, but you work for one of the world's largest department stores and you have the power to give me a $10 million order, well, something better be showing up in your house, yeah. you know, with a, you know, brand new Mercedes symbol on the front of it, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that a lot of people didn't realize. And I said, well, then let me share this stuff because it's great, but you, you got to hear this stuff. You got me on this Yakuza story. <laughs> can we can we go back to that moment, though? Yeah. So, like, you're in the locker room or whatever. These guys are saying to you, like, we think we should manufacture your stuff. Yeah. I know you're, you know, street smart guy and you're being strong. Like, how do you respond to them when they say that to you? Sure, give me a card. Yeah, <laughs> give me a card. Yeah, we're, we're gonna call you right now. Absolutely. And then you call the your. Uh, well, I go to dinner yeah. with the guys in Mitsubishi. And I go, I go. I don't know much, but I know when I'm being pressed. Yeah. And they were like, you know, who who did this? And I gave them the card, and they were like, uh, you know, let, we'll take care of it. I we'll mean, they, it. yeah. And, and, you know, they took care of it. You know, they're very polite. Right. So they're right. Like, what the yeah. Fuck? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, so they handled it, um, but like yeah, they handled it. But the next time they invited me over to Japan, I didn't go. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how it was handled. I don't know anything. Yeah, you know yeah. What I, mean? I mean, those dudes are that's that's they're a, the real deal. Yeah, it's a serious group of dudes. They're the real deal. So yeah, yeah there you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the back of the, that world. I mean, you got models, you got you got a lot of glamour, you got yeah. Um, all of us just see you know. The photos yeah. and the clothes in the department store. Yeah, you got wild parties. You got uplifting moments of going to neighborhoods and being able to give, you know, hundreds of computers and help kids and schools really? and stuff like that. So there's so many different ups and downs when when so many things are happening that I, 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 want, I wanted to put this out there so people just kind of know. Is this a fun walk down memory lane, but also educational at the same time? Any um, other, like... I don't know, either encounter like that or a celebrity story that you can touch on from that because people love to hear. Yeah, I, you know what? I was, I, I, I remember um, Mike Tyson. I, I love telling the story about Mike. He, um, he had just came home from jail and we were trying to get a hold of him because we wanted to put, sponsor him and put Fubu on his shorts. But you know, if you really, if, you, if you're a fan of Mike, you know there's, he never wore it. Black anything. trunks and black, black trunks. Shoes. That's it, right? Yeah. So we ended up sponsoring Lennox Lewis, and Lennox Lewis ended up becoming a very good friend, and we sponsored him through all his fights. And I remember um, we were in Vegas, and Mike Tyson threw a party, and we went over, and I didn't know Mike. We didn't know Mike that well. He was from Brooklyn, I was from Queens. Go over, and he's walking around in the party, and then he sees me, and he comes over to me, and he goes, Were you a poiki gang? A fubu? I said, yeah. And he poked me in the chest, bing, 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 like like once or twice. I forgot how many times, but I still got a dent <laughs> yeah. from when he poked me. Yeah. It was like 20 years ago. He said, Lennox Lewis couldn't even sell pantyhose. And my bodyguard used to be Mike's bodyguard. Mm -hmm. And my bodyguard said to me, he said, we got to get out of here. I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> he says, because... Mike's gonna walk around and he's gonna he's gonna he's he's upset. I can tell. I know him, and he's gonna come here. And I don't want to start fighting my guys. And he said, no matter how much I fight my guys, Mike's gonna get a hold of you. <laughs> so let's go. No, I was already gone. Oh yeah. When he said that, <laughs> he said that. I already left. Uh, fuck this. So. It's the trade show again, a magic show, uh, and like a year or two years from then, we're running to the plane at the end of the night. It was like a midnight flight, uh, red eye, me and my partners. We're running to the plane, get on the plane, sit down, and then all of a sudden, the plane, the doors will close, but then the doors open again. They say, well, sorry, one more passenger. And Mike comes on, and he sits right next to me, and he goes, hello, and he goes, and he, go, and he falls right to sleep. He has no idea it's me. Hence, my Red Lobster history, <laughs> he had a soda or tea right here. And the whole night, I was trying to spit in it. I was, I was trying to, I, I just, 
But I knew he was. I knew at any moment he was gonna see me spitting in it. Cause if if he would have just went, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I had this lungy. I think I ate like tuna fish. I had a tuna uh, fish lungy ready uh, for it. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't get the spit out. <laughs> That's good. But we left the plane, and because my partner, we were all in the first in various different areas. We get down to the luggage, and it clicked because he then saw all four of us together. And when you see all four, we used to yeah. be on the hang tags. Yeah. And we're like, let's get the bag, let's get out of here. And I remember we were leaving, he was like this. <laughs> and I told him that story. I finally got the nerve to tell him. And he said, man, you are so evil. He, he was like, that? thank God you didn't spit in my shit. Oh, my <laughs> so God. You're so evil. Yeah. But, um, Holy shit. Yeah, you know... Um, Rogan told me that he has this new studio in Austin and he had a new desk made. And right before the, uh, remember when, uh, not that long ago, Tyson did the fight with uh, Roy Jones Jr., mm -hmm. the Triller fight. Yeah. So he's, he came on to promote it when he was training for that fight. And he'd been on before. I was, I was actually on part of an episode with, with him. And, but now a couple years passed and he's, and he's in this new setup. And it was a different mic because he was training for the fight. And like at one point he said, um, he's like sitting like this with Joe. He goes, yeah, the, the gods of war has awoke, have awoken me and the spirits within. And Joe, he said, he ended that podcast and he called his carpenter guy. He was like, I want like five more inches between me and whoever sits across. <laughs> he was like, it was way too fucking scary. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, yeah, he's a yeah. special guy. Special yeah. Special guy, you yeah, know. Yeah. He, he, you I were going to spit in his fucking drink, you psycho. I, it was six hours of shaking, <laughs> trying to spit. Think about how I talk about analysis paralysis. Oh my god! Yeah, those, uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, are stories like that on the on this too? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's god. in there, and uh, that's in there. I go in more in detail on it, but there's there's a lot of stories like that. Yeah, dude, that's the best. Founding Fubu. You can listen to it on Audible only. Audible Originals. Yep. Audible Originals. Uh, there will be more Audible Originals coming down the pipeline. Pipeline produced by you. Yep. You're always doing, uh, you know, we're in the middle of the 13th season of Shark Tank. Um, there's there's a, a hundred things you're doing. It's a, it's a, it's always a fun chat. You're an inspiration. Thank you for coming. Thanks, man. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. I feel better. Thank you. See you guys.